Welcome to the podcast, Appetite for Distortion, episode number 269, another episode you can hear via or watch via Zoom, I should say. So if you go to our YouTube channel, and I'm glad this time I get to actually see uh, our, our new friend, uh, Rich uh, Beinstock, the the co-author, because we last time we had him just on the radio and he was part of like my other other job uh, for premiere and just hit you like a million, uh, give or take a, f- a couple interviews that day. 900,000. Yeah. 900,000 for the debut of nothing but a good time. Uh, but now I get to speak for him longer. I get to see him be jealous of his full head of hair, <laughs> but also he brought with him his, uh, his co-host uh, Tom. And I think I tried to fix, I tried to settle this with, with rich last episode uh, when you were on. How do I properly say your last name? Do I say Bajol? Do I have a, an accent to it? Uh, Bajor? Bajor. Bajor. Okay. Yeah. Huh. I, I like it. It's, it's, or, it's, I mean, in French, it's Bajor. But yeah, Bajor. <laughs> I don't know. I speak to people, as I'm sure you've done, especially for the book, just all over the world. And I don't know. I try to, even though I'm just a dumb New Yorker, I, I can barely speak my own language. I try to, if I can, add a little spice, uh, you know, <laughs> Like, all right, I'm going to move on. Uh, well, the fun, I, I would say the funny thing is because we did talk about how to pronounce Tom's name, but we didn't talk about how to pronounce mine, which is actually Beanstalk. Beanstalk. Yeah. I saw your face when I said that. I was going to take the guess. <laughs> so it's yeah. Beanstalk. Okay. Exactly. See, now, uh, yeah. th- did I say Beanstalk? I must have said Beanstalk the first time then. Oh, you, you did. Yeah, that's okay, though. You didn't correct me. I've heard worse. No, I didn't want to interrupt. Okay. So Beanstalk. And that's why as I, I'm going to change my name. No, I'm going to leave it up there. So I get Weisler a, a lot. So it's Weisler. So that's why okay. I just shop at Brando. Whatever. That's enough. of People don't care about our names. They <laughs> want to care about the names, <laughs> the, the amount of names that you had in, in your book, which is just the amount of reception that the, the, the positive reviews of this book. I don't know about you. I, I, I didn't write it. And I was overwhelmed by you see all these rock stars coming out like this is if you weren't there, you got to read nothing but a good time. The uncensored uh, history of 80s hard rock. So how did you, because you're both journalists, I know you cross paths with other journalists, but how did you two kind of, you know, team up to put this together? Um, we met a long time ago at, at uh, Guitar World magazine uh, in the mid 90s. I was the managing editor at the time. I was like five years older than Rich. And uh, he, Rich came in as an intern, I guess in 97, 96, one of those. 97, yeah. And uh, so, and like, so, and um, we worked together on Guitar World and then uh, we were just in the same office for a long time. We ended up also working together on um, Guitar Aficionado magazine, which was like this luxury guitar magazine I started after I did Revolver for 10 years. So we were like around each other for forever and always talking about sort of this music, like whenever we had any spare time or actually when we were supposed to be doing other things, um, we'd be like, you know, postulating about something that CC DeVille did or like, like just like dissecting a warrant record. And so we, <laughs> so we kind of were always um, talking about this stuff, particularly early on, like in the mid nineties, this wasn't as journalists, the music that you really got to cover, you know, like the, mm. it, back then, we were going out and covering like Soundgarden and presidents of the United States and band and offspring. And, and so like this music was kind of in its dormant phase after it had been canceled. So okay. we didn't really have the opportunity to interview a lot of these people at the time, even though they had been very popular in the guitar magazines a few years earlier. Um, and so we had just always been on the same page with this stuff. And then we about, probably 10 years ago started talking about maybe doing the book and then four years ago actually started actually doing the book you know so so it's been a long journey f- with the two of us the best think, years of our lives <laughs> i think it, it shows though so how did the approach go as far as how to put it together because you get, did a lot of interviews were there interviews that you you got i'm sure there were a lot of new interviews or what did you take that was old and like okay this needs to be in there or this needs to be updated we need to get a follow up quote from this person or was that just kind of like the natural process of you know sitting down and be like all right who are the bands we want to talk about i don't know if you've noticed i'm wearing my poison t-shirt yeah it's you got it all shirt. covered yeah. in the whole spectrum yeah yeah no i you got to so you have to start somewhere so mm-hmm. <laughs> so like where did you i guess start 
we kind of just started, you know, I don't know that we sat down and we were like, you know, these 10 bands were going to, to really hone in on. I think we probably kind of talked about that at some point, but I think we also just had a sense a lot about of who a lot of those bands would be like, I mean, and for people that haven't read the book, it is this sort of chronological look at the decade, but within that, I mean, we follow certain trends that are going on in the scene, but then we also really follow about 10 bands from beginning to, you know, end of that time period. Um, you know, some of those being like Guns N' Roses and Poison and Motley Crue and, you know, Rat and, and, and White Lion, a bunch of others. Um, so, but when it came to doing the book, I mean, two things. One, as far as doing the oral history, that was a conversation right at the beginning about, do we do this oral history? Do we just write it out as prose? Um, our our uh, agent had, you know, a lot of, a lot to do with us going with the oral history um, direct path, just basically like saying to us at the beginning, like, so you guys are going to do an oral history, right? And <laughs> we've been thinking about it. Not really yeah. giving you a choice there. Right. But, but we, I think we had been leaning that way, but we were like, okay, I guess we are. But I think the reason we, one of the reasons we wanted to do it that way is we just wanted to tell the story in the voices of these people. Um, you know, we just felt like that, that's a much better way to just put you right there in the action. We both, you know, have read Please Kill Me and, and Meet Me in the Bathroom and some of these other books and the oral history format for, for music really, you know, it's, it's something that I've always loved. Um, I think it's a really appealing way to do these books. And then as far as the interviews, uh, you know, there's over 200 people in the book, I'd say 90%. Well, we actually, we did over 200 interviews for the book. So about, I'd say like 90% of, the, of this is all new interviews that were done specifically for the book with a few things peppered in here or there, if it was someone we couldn't get, or if it was just, again, like Tom mentioned, we've spent so many years, decades at Guitar World and those types of magazines. So we had so many interviews with some of these people. Um, so we had some material that we wanted to use that we knew would fit, but really for the most part, it's all new interviews just done over a four year span of time and just going after anyone and everyone that we could find. When you were at, uh, you know, Guitar World, would, would anybody make fun of you, like, that you like this era of music? Because I would get that, too. Being younger than both of you, it's like, why do you <laughs> like these bands? You know, I, and I admit it, because I'm, I'm 37, I had to buy this Poison t-shirt at a Hot Topic in college. And, and well like, Why? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I like the band. I like them. Like, what do you want I from me? I think people have all, when you like this kind of music, I think if you are talking about this music with the wrong kind of person, you always get made in fun of. Sure. <laughs> you know, like I that. sort of, um, there's people who get this music and people who kind of, they're like, oh, that stuff sucked. And um, at Guitar World, it was a little bit different because the editor in chief, Brad Talinsky, he had been there for the whole like the tail end of the 80s too so he was just doing what everybody else was doing they they didn't make fun of us they were just pivoting like everyone else and trying to survive because like you mm -hmm. know um so but you know you get a little bit like I, again that's one of the things with this book that i'm really happy with is i don't think i'm ever in my lifetime going to convince somebody who doesn't want to be convinced that warrant is an awesome band or that white lion is an awesome band even though i believe them to be but with the book, because you're reading about these people's struggles and hearing their own voices, like, I think you will walk away from it with a respect for the people. Um, so I think that that's the best way to counter when people like dismiss this music is to show them like that the people involved in these bands worked harder than anybody else and are like real funny, nice, you know, dudes and, and, and women. And so that to me was like the way to counter the knee jerk reaction that some people have about quote hair metal, where they're just like, eh, that stuff is bullshit. <laughs> like, which, I've, I, which is like a, a point of pride I've always held of knowing that it isn't mm -hmm. when people start saying that. And I, I think also, you know, yeah. Guitar World, if any, if any place was like a safe space for this type of thing, <laughs> Guitar World was that place. I mean, you know, it, it was the type of place where I mean, we all have guitars at our desks and everything. And like, you would just be playing like white snake riffs to each other. And like, you know, talking about Adrian Vandenberg versus John Sykes. And, and this was normal everyday conversation and like nobody even batted an eye. 
um, which maybe gave us an unrealistic outlook on the world in a way too. And like <laughs> maybe helped in terms of doing this book being like, yeah, man, everyone loves this stuff because yeah. we had always been surrounded by like the five people that, that truly do. Um, but yeah, but, and then, but what Tom was saying about, you know, Warren and white line, like not convincing people that you can't convince anyone to like what they don't like, but a main goal with the book from the beginning was to show that like, Hey, you can love this stuff. You can hate this stuff, but like, this was a valid musical movement and a valid cultural movement that like deserves to be documented and respected for what these guys did, whether or not, you know, you like it. I think some of the best songwriting happened during that time in musicianship and it gets overshadowed uh, by that term hair metal. So, I mean, how do you feel about it? I mean, you know, my insecurities about hair, but I'm not offended by the term. <laughs> so uh, what I was, it never bothered me. I just thought it was a cool term. What do you, how do you guys feel about it? We were really careful. As you will note, it is not on the cover of the book. Mm, right. it, you know, it says hard uh, 80s hard rock. And the reason the reason that we look I in my sort of daily discussion about this stuff, like I say hair metal, I say glam metal. Um, but the reason it's not on the cover and the reason like so that we didn't like sort of lead with that term is that I think it does. It doesn't bother me, but I wasn't in one of those bands. I think for some of the people who were like the guys in Skid Row or, um, you know, definitely the guys in Guns N' Roses, but like people of that era, I think for them, it is like reductionist and, and sort of a, ne it has a negative connotation because that's how it started, you know? Um, and so we wanted to do people the honor if they were going to give us an hour of their time for an interview for the book to then not turn around and sort of, and sort of um, belittle their their contribution with using that term again i i, I kind of use it freely but i can see if i like how tom Kiefer, who has written you know tons of amazing songs and blah 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 does not like having his contributions to to rock history sort of reduced yeah to that term so we just so we were just careful with it in 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 that way so that um you know, we wouldn't bum anybody out who was in the book. We figured we could get around it. Um, yeah. So again, like it's a term I use. I listen to Hair Nation all the time. <laughs> but if I, if I was, yeah, if I was Scotty Hill or Rachel Bolin of Skid Row, I might not want to be, you know, necessarily called hair metal, even though it's convenient. Yeah, I, I get that because it could be dismissive because a lot of these guys and gals, they wrote amazing songs, but you just think hair metal, you're just seeing the visual. You're not yeah. you're just thinking the visual. And also, if you called it hair metal, I might not have thought Guns N' Roses would be in the book because I don't consider them what mm -hmm. has been deemed hair metal. So it would have been kind of exclusive too. you know, left some bands out that Absolutely. were that deserve to be the, the 80s, which you can't, you know, you're labeled in the decade. You can't escape that. But the hard rock uh, element of it. So uh, Rich, uh, I, I still I'm kicking myself. Beanstalk. You, you think there I would get that right? Uh, you were you were telling me when like before we I think we recorded and started recording the interview uh, the first time around that you and Tom had listened to my pocket this podcast as far as research and like some of the older uh, interviews. I, I'm always blown away that anyone has listened to me. You know, I I feel like everyone's like my mom is like, oh, you're on the radio. I've heard <laughs> about that. Uh, so uh, that's cool. So like. Who, like who did you listen to again? Like, what did you mm -hmm. find out that, cause I didn't think uh, I was in everybody who I interviewed like Chris Weber and um, who else is they've told their stories before, but I guess sometimes maybe I get a new little detail out of them, which is like, I guess is the point. So what yeah. did you, what did you find out about <laughs> guns and roses from this podcast? I just made it all up. I never oh. <laughs> just to butter you up for the, Thank no, you. I mean, yeah, I, I was super familiar with your podcast and like, Look, I mean, in our book, we go deep into that early Guns N' Roses history, and your podcast is the place to find out a lot of a lot of that stuff. And like you mentioned, Chris Weber was absolutely one of the episodes I listened to. Um, I would say you you had Rob Gardner on. Yeah, correct? I was just yeah. about to yeah Rob Gardner episode Rob Gardner. fifty. I remember that. Okay, yeah. it was absolutely another one because these are guys like yeah, all right. There's some stuff out there with Chris Weber, maybe a little bit with Rob Gardner, but not 
to the not not in depth like the way you've gone with them. I mean, to sit and listen for an hour to an interview with Rob Gardner. I mean, I don't I don't know that that exists anywhere else. True. In the world, honestly, um, mm. you know, and Chris, Chris Weber too. I mean, you 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 know your stuff clearly when it comes to this world, and like those those interviews are super detailed. Um, you know, some guys that we didn't like. I didn't talk to like Raz, um, who okay. was you know like the LA guns manager Raz Q, on. right yeah but I did listen to your episode and that provided a lot of great background mm. um you know and so a lot of those types of guys like did, I don't know did you have Steve Darrow on your show ever I did not I've tried to okay. reach out but it's it's interesting you know who mm-hmm. um and I'll get to this as far as you probably have obviously have easier access to get guests given your both of your resumes but sometimes it's hard to find these people, you know, it's kind of, it's just networking. I meet one person who knows somebody else. So that was a, a name. I saw he just recently was interviewed on Mark Cantor's podcast. So maybe, okay. maybe that's a way to reach out for me to get him now, but yeah. Yeah. And, that. and he's in the book as well. And he, and he was a great resource, but a lot of these guys, like, I mean, I listen, you know, I'm just naming guys that you've talked to that we also have in the book, but honestly, like I just listened to a ton of your episodes when, when, when we were putting together, all of our Guns N' Roses stuff, because it's really, I don't know a better place to kind of find that history other than like, you know, Mark Cantor's book, you know, and Mark, and Mark's sure. another one who's in, who's in our book. And like, these are the guys that kind of tell, you know, who have that history. Um, and most of them have appeared on your show. So like, so yeah, like I spent a lot of time in my car, like basically anywhere I was driving, like listening to episodes of Appetite for Distortion. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, I guess you knew what you were getting into when I interviewed you that I make mistakes often. And I appreciate that I've been able to trick you that I know my stuff. I try to. I definitely uh, try to. I can't help the uh, when I was born, you know, 1983. I, I can't help it. But I want to relive that. So I loved when uh, MTV and VH1 would have those uh, hair metal shows. That's like I really gravitated towards that. I love it. So I guess yeah. uh, my question is, from doing a Guns Roses podcast, how hard it is sometimes to get information. Were they the band or what bands or artists maybe was the most difficult to get research on, to get more information on that wasn't out there yet? That was probably the most challenging part of uh, of it. Hmm. They are, I mean, they're, they're not super, it's, it's, it's specific little pockets that you run into it's exactly what you were just talking about about like finding people <clears throat> like for poison um finding the other guitar player matt smith who is the guy who moved to la with poison and was in poison and then went home uh because his girlfriend was pregnant and gets replaced eventually after slash you know slash and mm. and cc both audition for poison and then cc gets the gig but that's they were replacing this guy matt smith and like like you're saying, dude, like finding a guy named Matt Smith in, in <laughs> Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Like, you're right, just like yeah. I, I remember Googling like Matt Smith. And then I'm like, <laughs> fuck, you know, <laughs> I'm you the same cents. thing I do. I love you know? it. Yeah. I mean, what else do you, and then, and then you're like trying to figure out and like the guy doesn't have a Facebook page and he's not, and you're just like, fuck, we got to get this guy. How do we do it? And then like suddenly, I don't know how. I mentioned it because I, I had interviewed him for something like I was doing a follow-up interview with like Brian Forsyth of Kicks was just because they're sort of from the same area. Mm. It's like, oh yeah, I think I know a dude who knows that dude. And then you, and you, you know what I mean? And then <laughs> that's you're like, how it happens. yeah, and that's how it happens. So there were specific Love things it. like that that were really like hard to track down. And I mean, like for, and but like for, I, I, I honestly think that Rich's job, uh, the job, because he was the main person on this beat his his job tracking down um his reporting for the guns Guns and roses stuff i think was definitely the most thorough and like um against all like he track you know what i mean like finding people like oh the dude who was the you know like it's to me his his gig doing that was probably the hardest that and like maybe me tracking down Vito brada like Mm. you know which because he's done one interview, you know, so but like um, in, in 20 years. But th- th- I think the Guns N' Roses stuff is definitely the most uh, impressive quote unquote reporting in the book. 
How does that make you feel rich? I'm, I'm blushing. I hope this is just on audio. And not video. <laughs> um, well, I would say thank you. I would say, you know, and to, you know, Tom probably and not to, to just stroke each other, but like, <laughs> No, the, okay. If there were, Go if there, Tom on his end landed probably the two white whales in the book, which, as he mentioned, were Vito Brada and Matt Smith, because these are both guys. I mean, Vito was someone from day one who we were just like, we gotta get Vito Brada. Um, Tom, you know, and Tom did it, and he got not only did he get him, but he got him multiple times and just got a ton of information from him, like more than I've ever read. And and again, as two guys who come from the guitar world world like he's one of those guys and like he just disappeared off the face of the earth and like here he is in living color in our book and then matt smith is the other one where tom and i both as insane poison fans like <laughs> i've looked for matt smith stuff over the years like beyond research for this book like i've just wanted to read interviews with him like there's nothing out there there was like one thing um but you know we got him and like that was definitely one of those where like you know, the minute the, the interview was over, like I was waiting for Tom to like call me and tell me everything you know, about <laughs> this guy. So, so yeah, so those types of moments were pretty, were pretty, you know, awesome. And then, but as far as the Guns N' Roses stuff, yeah, it's like, by, I mean, you know, probably better than anyone, like trying to find some of these guys. And then also once you find them, approaching them to talk about this stuff, like yeah. there's so much history and so much, you know, probably good memories and bad memories. Like you approach a guy like Rob Gardner and it's just like, it's hard enough to find him. And then it's like, well, you're asking him to talk about this stuff, which is something that he's probably, whenever someone approaches him, that's what they're asking him about, right? And this right. is 35 years ago, it didn't end well, you know? And, like, and so it's like, how do you go there um, and, gently sort of get him on board and you know Chris Webber too it's like I mean Chris Webber is great as you know but like probably every time somebody reaches out to him it's to talk about Guns N' Roses 35 mm -hmm. years ago like how many times does this guy want to do that right um but he was great and he was into it and like and Steve Darrow too and like you know I think Rob Gardner I think actually came through Tracy Guns and Tracy is a really good friend um, and an awesome guy. And he was so helpful with the book, just in terms of his own recollections and in terms of reaching out to guys like that. I mean, you know, he also got us like Tammy Down and Mick Cripps and all these guys, but like he got Rob Gardner on board. Um, and so it's like hard enough to find these guys. And then you have to gently, you have to be very gentle with them in a way, but then also really go deep with them and get, and get the real story. So, so yeah, the Guns N' Roses stuff, I guess, was a little tricky in that way. And then you add in the fact that the, the, the history is so confusing you know, <laughs> with the LA gun stuff and, yeah. and all that, it's like, so just bizarre. And like, you know, as somebody who has been a fan since appetite came out, and still not really understanding like Slash is in the band, Slash is out of the band, Steven's in the band, he's out of the band, there's Road Crew, there's Hollywood Rose, there's Rose, there's LA Guns, you know, it's like, what is going on? So trying to tell that story in a coherent way was, was um, yeah, it was definitely a challenge. Yeah, uh, I'm glad you, I feel your pain. I want to say that I feel your pain because you, uh, I want to pay respects to those who've been uh, doing journalism longer than I have, so... It's it's nice to see and, and to hear that both of you are going through the kind of the same uh, hoops and obstacles, the same thing that I go through. When you mentioned Tracy Guns, he's been very nice to me on Twitter, but I think he, he just sees appetite for distortion. All they're going to want to talk to me about is Guns N' Roses for an hour. That's not, I mean, as rich as you've listened, that's not really what I do, you know, depending upon the guest. Uh, you know, I could talk to Tracy just about his bar mitzvah for like an hour. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so I'm being gentle with that. I've spoken to the L.A. guns manager since and hopefully I'll get Tracy on in the future. But you're right. you got to be gentle. It's hard. And I don't come. You guys at least come with like a resume, I guess. But still, it's it's tricky. But, but I mean, dude, dude, it took me just like not on the guns and roses thing, but like I can I could produce for you 18 months of emails to get our Sebastian Bach interview. He's another one. 
Do you know what I mean? Like 18, like for real, like, and they were like, not like the, nobody was being an asshole or anything. They were being super nice and like, but he was busy. And when he's touring, he doesn't do press because like, he's got to sing and like this, that, the other thing. And it took forever. And it, it does. You just got to be, you just got to be patient because you can't, there's no, you know, I, I think that uh, sort of the, the, what's the word the lure of like oh exposure for these guys is not you know is not like something like oh dude sebastian bach or, or tracy guns like you do this it's really gonna like you know people are gonna hear it it's gonna really oh, yeah, move they don't care you know it's just them giving you their time and so you yeah. have to prove that you're worthy and yeah. you have to just stay cool you have to and just keep at <laughs> and but and keep asking and 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 never send that snippy email like i'm no, like okay, no, you no, know no. yeah um, yeah but that, there was a lot of that for, for both Rich and I doing this book of just like, you just gotta keep keep asking and maybe sometimes they're not seeing the requests and sometimes they don't care. And like they're, mm. they're, they're like toilet exploded or their houses, you know what I mean? And like, <laughs> right, it's like, okay. So you just gotta keep the faith and like, just keep right going on. until somebody just says, fuck you, no, leave me alone. <laughs> Which I've, I've got that, yeah. that just means no <laughs> circle back in a year <laughs> right circle back. <laughs> Try again. oh wow this is uh this is making me feel good but why i'm looking i look forward to this interview because there is no pressure so we can just talk it's like none of us are really gonna you know worry about uh, any of like the the rock star you know uh, problems as far as you know clickbait we're just guys talking about uh, the music that we love so while i have you here what guns and roses experiences do you have that might not be in the book you know, what concerts have you gone to? Maybe some fun interview stories, obviously, from either Rich or, or Tom. Do you have any fun GNR stories? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, Tom has definitely seen better GNR concerts than I have. Um, but, you know, I've seen them a ton of times over the years. Probably the, fir the first time I saw them was on the Illusion Tour at Madison Square Garden, you know, Soundgarden opening like everyone's experience, they went on super late. I was so young, I couldn't stay until the end, blah, blah, blah. Um, but, you know, as far as like interview experiences, I mean, I've been lucky enough, like I've interviewed everybody from the, the you know, the Appetite lineup over the years. Um, including Axel? Including Axel. I interviewed Axel. I, I mean, I would actually say, I think to this day, it's the, his, his most recent print interview is in 2014. Uh, for Revolver, actually, because right, Revolver, right. Guns N' Roses headlined uh, the Revolver Golden Go Gods that year. And actually, mm -hmm. I mean, that was a story in itself, too. I don't think there was a headliner. Uh, we'd been trying to get Kiss. That didn't work out. And I actually emailed Bumblefoot, who was in the band at that time. And somehow he made it happen. And they played and they were great. They were supposed to play three songs. They played like an hour and a half. Um, and so I interviewed Axel for the cover story. Um, and he was great. And he took forever to get on the phone. It was one of these things where like, I literally had to be available like 24 seven. And it mm -hmm. was like getting a call, like Axel's going to call you 10 minutes. And I would be like out at dinner and I'd have to get home. And like, then he wouldn't call. And then like, you know, and finally there was one night, like he called and he was just like, it was like really late at night and like Axel's going to call, be ready, be ready. And I was ready. And he called and he's just like, Hey, this is Axel. What's up? And like, he was totally just like this completely chill guy. Like there was no, it wasn't intense. Like he wasn't super serious. Great interview. Um, you know, I, I, and I've interviewed all the other guys. Like I've interviewed Slash probably more than anybody in my career, like probably at least 20 times. Mm. Um, and he's always great. He, you know, he's just a super cool guy. We've done other projects together. I've done bios for him. So like, so Slash is probably the guy um that Do you i have, have like a picture like a side by side with your hair together like like long lost brothers we have several pictures yes well um, i'm assuming you have pictures but yeah. with like like really highlighting the hair because you could be his his other brother uh rash I, sorry <laughs> I, I took the i took the r richard sorry <laughs> um you know what my my hair doesn't look that impressive standing next to him it's okay. like really you know, it, it really just, he sort of dwarfs me in that category, okay, but, fair uh, enough. <laughs> but, but I do, you know, I also play guitar and I certainly have modeled my, my whole deal after slash all these years. Um, you know, he's a big inspiration, but, but, you know, so, so yeah, like I've definitely had, I'm sort of rambling here, but I've had a lot of experiences like with these guys over the years. I mean, Duff 
as well. Like, and Duff was great for the book. He, he did multiple interviews. Um, you know, so at, at, I guess the last thing I'll throw in and then I'll stop babbling was I actually had the opportunity to unofficially roadie for them at the, um, the Hall of Fame mm. in 2012, which I forgot about through a friend. You forgot about that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, a friend of um, this guy, Mike Squires, who was in. Oh, yeah. He does a theme song for my, my podcast. Well, there you go. And Mike is incredible, dude. Yeah, love him. Um, and he's in Duff's band, Loaded. Loaded. Yeah. And he was helping out at the Hall of Fame. And I was there and he was like, dude, just come. So he got me backstage and like I helped set up Guns N' Roses, um, you know, stage for when they came out. And like, and at that time, just the idea of like, you know, even Slash and Duff and, you know, Gilby and like Steven, like playing Guns N' Roses songs was like crazy, you know, cause there was no reunion yet. Um, so we got to help set up the stage and like, you know, there was a point backstage where it was like Duff and Slash and Billy Joe Armstrong, um, practicing Mr. Brownstone because he came out and played it with them and like they literally banged it out in like five minutes before that in the bathroom of their dressing room and like they were like all right these are the chords let's go um so yeah so I've had some fun like GNR related experiences I'd say so yeah I mean interviewing Axel and being a part of like the hall of fame I mean I I'd say so and uh this conversation before i ask you know uh ask you tom it's it's helped me because then some of the names that you mentioned yeah i've got to interview slash's son a couple times Mm -hmm. yeah it's very nice uh i've interviewed duff's brother two of his brothers his wife uh twice and he his management i guess turned me down thinking that i'm i guess a fanboy i i guess so that that kind of broke my heart a little bit so I'm, I'm going to keep the, the patience going as Guns N' Roses said, as Tom, <laughs> as that was the word, just be patient. So I'm just hoping uh, one day I'll grow up to be uh, like, like Rich and Tom and get some of these bigger uh, interviews. Although, I mean, that's what amazes me. It's like when you listen to me to get stuff, it's you like, got I, us, I, I read you to get stuff, you know. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Tom? What shows have you been to? Uh, a Hall I, of Fame experience as an as a, as a old, <laughs> as the resident old dude here. Um, <laughs> I was at the Ritz show, the nice. one that was on MTV all the time. So I wow. won tickets. I, re- I remember winning tickets to that either on W NYU, which was the NYU station or mm-hmm. FMU. I mean, um, uh, uh, SOU, the fairly, um, Seton hall. And, okay. um, so I went to that, that the, the, the famous great white guns and roses show at the Ritz. And that was, I mean, I was a big fan. I had already bought the record. Like I, I was, I was on it the second that record came out like I was like holy shit you know this, this is something really amazing and um and that show I mean I, I've I've said it before but it's really true it was so good like I can't I mean I've seen a bazillion shows at this point and I can't remember most of them probably mm-hmm. but uh I can remember watching that and sort of like one it's like one of five times that I've seen a band where you you just like know and like they were on that night like there was really they were good so like it was like it was just like you're like whoa this is actually an important moment and this band is 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 the the real fucking deal you know like and it hasn't it really hasn't happened that often like another weird the only other couple times it's happened it's a weird thing because they're not really that much alike it's like I once saw Pantera open for Prong in 1989. Wow. And just like, I mean, both utterly destroy Prong because like it just that, you know, but like seeing it was like that level, the same thing where you see you're seeing a band and you're just like that you're familiar with, but you haven't fully you've never seen them live before. And you're like, oh, my God, there's something <laughs> there's something coming off that state like there's actually something an energy and like a danger and an attitude coming off the stage. Like I'm getting goosebumps a little bit right, right now. And you're <laughs> and just like, Oh fuck. Um, so I saw that show and I saw the giant stadium show that the paradise city video nice. uh, is taken from where they played with uh, deep purple and Aerosmith. Nice. Um, so th- I was early, I was in early and then I don't, you know, I don't know, honestly, if I've seen them, since the 80s okay. i don't 
maybe I saw them once at um no, I think I saw them at did they play like uh Ham Hammerstein Ballroom? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I've seen them once more since then. But those two I almost like didn't want to spoil it. It's a, I hear that. Guns N' Roses for me is a tough band because they're one of those bands where that record is so good and I've listened to it so much that like I kind of now and this, you're probably just going to shut off my feed but it's hard <laughs> to like because you've heard those songs so many times like oh and like sometimes you'll be like listening to the radio and it's like do I really do I want to hear Paradise City right now like I've heard it seven million times and it's hard to remember that when that thing came out and it's something that 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 Rich and I talk about it, like it shift, it changed. It probably changed hard rock and had more stylistically and visually to do with changing the way bands look than like grunge did. It was, it was so important at that time. And it's hard because it's so monumental and you've heard it so many times to remember like that when it came out, it was really, you were really like, what is this? These guys are dangerous and mean and I'm afraid of them, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I wish I had that. I never experienced the 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 dangerous Guns N' Roses. I, yeah, I but know. then you would be getting your prostate examined. Back. So you're like, <laughs> you, know, you win some, you lose some. Fair enough. Fair enough. But yeah, I understand what you mean, especially working in radio. There are songs that are all timers that I'm like, I, I just can't anymore. And there are a couple, only a couple of GNR songs like Live and Let Die. And I've said this before, Live and Let Die, Knocking on Heaven's Door. I just, I, 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 don't want to hear them anymore. I've just, I'm at that point in my life because they're overdone on radio. And they're also for me, they're, they're not original GNR songs. So I just mm -hmm. don't, you know, right. my, my heart's not into them. I love them, but it's, so I, I understand what you, uh, exactly what you mean. Uh, <laughs> I just love that you can watch your, your two concert experiences, whatever you want online, you know, that you were at the <laughs> in, in Paradise City. Oh, but that's, that's interesting though, that how much they, they changed that time period. So do you think anyone, and we spoke about hair metal at the beginning, that the term were offended by GNR in that way, being like, you're trying, like, you're like us. Why are you trying to be different? Like, or, you know, because they did like, like Pantera, as you mentioned, they started out with kind of glamish. Was there kind of like, hey, you know, you were glam first. Don't try to be this now. Was there any of that during that time period? You know, I don't, I mean, I don't recall it at the time. And, you know, like Tom, I mean, I, I got into, it was like, you know, I probably saw Guns N' Roses when anyone at that time did. Like I saw the Welcome to the Jungle video and I was just like, this is it. Um, you know, and then like Sweet Child of Mine and you see Slash, it's, you know, goes into that crouch and starts the song and like, so, you know, I don't think that people really, it was just something about them where like, it was never, in my opinion, it, people never really seem to care that much that like, yeah, you'd seen earlier photo of Axel and he had his hair all sprayed up, you know, and that kind of thing. Like, because it was sort of gradual with them. Like even, I mean, in the Welcome to the Jungle video, he has his hair sprayed up, right? And then by right. Sweet Child of Mine, it's like the Guns N' Roses we all kind of know from that time. So it was just like, you knew where they came from. You know, you knew that they were a Sunset Strip band. And that's what Sunset Strip bands look like at that time. So like, as they sort of started to just kind of bring it down a little bit, like it was just done in a very natural way. And even in, in the Welcome to the Jungle days, they still look like themselves, you know? And like, and you know, and so then we'd see the photos of Axel with like his assless chats and all <laughs> that. And like, it was kind of cool, but like no one really gave it a second thought, I don't think. Whereas with like a band like Pantera, I mean, it was such a break from what had come before and they really did try to bury it for a lot of years and they um, had did they had done four records in that in in that mode right and, and like, they were also like you know and it wasn't just the look it was the sound and it was like the names of the songs and you know it was like everything <laughs> changed uh, it was all the imagery and like guns and roses you know it's funny like there because i feel like it's more recently like whenever there's a best of list and all this stuff you know, best 80s hard rock or best 80s hair metal records. It's always like, should Guns N' Roses be on this list? Like there's such an argument and debate about that. But I feel like back then, I don't remember thinking about it. It was like, you liked Motley Crue and you liked Guns N' Roses and like, you probably liked Poison too. Like maybe not. That was probably like sort of the cutoff point. But hmm. 
it didn't seem like there was that much of a split. And you see that in our book as well. It's like Guns N' Roses, you know what they're going to become and you know they're going to transcend all this or whatever. But like, you know, they're hanging out at the cat house with Faster Pussycat and like all that stuff. And like, that's just the scene. Like that's where they come from, you know? And it's 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 interesting too, though, that like, I think Enrich does a really good job in pointing this out. Um, that the, and you know who else was really good at pointing this out was uh, uh, Chris from Junkyard. Okay. Um, that like there were kind of two LAs going at that time. So, you know, there was the strip, which was like the, the, the really glammy stuff. And then there was a, it really kind of was a parallel universe with the cat house and scream and, and, and the sort of the more Melrose bands like, like faster pussycat and stuff. And like the influences aren't even the same. So like, you can even look at Axl Rose when he's got the big hair and he might not even be, he might be doing that because he saw a really cool picture of Gene loves Jezebel or sisters of mercy. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like that's yeah. like, there was a whole, they were, that whole world was very different. And, and, and the guns people, you know, they're, they're mixing with, with Jane's addiction and stuff. And it's, I think it's just a very actually, and I know that there there's crisscross, but I think they are in a sort of a weird different, um, sort of universe which obviously they were able to pass between both worlds but you know with the hangman and all and all these other sort of sort of sleazier bands so um i think maybe their i don't know if their glam was influenced by what was going on on the strip as much as like maybe hanoi rocks and then other quote unquote cool bands you know so like it's it's not it's not clear to me like when their hair comes down is it i think they're trying to differentiate from the poisons and, and the other stuff but i don't think that necessarily the hair was up I, this is a very lot of, of talk about hair um <laughs> because they were because they were originally trying to fit in i think that they were just like saw other cool bands of the time that looked like that you know and seriously if you look like if you do look like it at a Sisters of Mercy or a, like any of those, or even Robert Smith at the time, like hair was big, man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the all shit of that. was big. Uh, yeah. Delta Burke, they all had big hair. Yeah, or is that everybody had big hair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I, cause I think there's a lot of artists today and it's been a topic of a uh, conversation throughout this podcast is like where are the rock stars now and you'll see country artists or hip hop, uh, I'll mention a specific because she's playing the same day as Guns N' Roses um, was it Napa Valley is Miley Cyrus and they'll go they were one genre once and then they're trying the rock thing and I try not to be that divisive rock fan because I wanted to lead I wanted to lead like it did in the 80s what I really kind of missed out on you know why your book is so great that I can relive stuff that I was you know missed out or too young to really enjoy do you see any sort of resurgence with it or is it just like niche for some people to be like hey let's do a rock album like Miley Cyrus you know or is it will it come back you know I think if it that, is if it is gone let's just yeah put it that way I think you know like I guess is it gone like no it's not gone but it's probably just going to be it probably is just going to be niche you know like it's just this thing it's not going to I don't think exist in the way that it did again I think that and that's okay you know like it's 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 I think these things were so big. I mean, forget about even just hair metal or whatever, like just the rock and roll era from like, you know, right. Classic rock era from like late sixties until whenever, like it just see, it was so big that it, and it permeated the culture so widely in the youth culture that you just assumed it would always be there. But like, it's probably just one of those things like that was the time for it, you know, and like it'll show up in different ways in the future, but like, it's not going to be that anymore you know album rock is not going to be what it was um and so you know i think probably the hardest part about continuing this music is that the people that do love it especially and even younger people are so committed to everything about it um you know not just the sound but also the look and sort of the style you know the imagery and like the lifestyle and all that that it it doesn't i don't know that it gets anything new added to it. And like, that's a, sort of a broad statement. Like, of course, there's some bands that do new things and do new spin on it. But 
people really want it to exist in this way. So a lot of the new bands you see, like you see these 20 year olds and like a lot of times they're Scandinavian or whatever. And like, and like, they look like they came off the sunset strip in 1985. Right. And that's kind of cool. I think, you know, for me, I mean, look, I'll even to take it from a little bit of a different, you know, sort of genre, like a band like Greta Van Fleet, which gets a lot of, you know, criticism and everything. And like, they do what they do really well. Like, yeah, it sounds a lot like Led Zeppelin. Like I would go see them in concert because I can't go see Led Zeppelin and like, you know, and they have some good tunes and like, you can kind of get that experience, but I don't know with some of those bands, why you would put on the record when you can just put on the record from the original band. And yeah. Like, I know what you mean. And it's just better, you know, like a band that looks like poison now might be cool to see in concert, but like, I'll just put on a poison record if I want to hear that sound because like, cause they just, they were great at it and like, I love poison. So like, I, I'm not gonna listen to a band that's just trying to do that. But I, I could also just be saying that because I'm old, you know, <laughs> maybe for a 20 year old, like they will listen to that. I mean, I do think to, that there is something about, like, I, I think the, a word that Rich uses a lot, which I think is a good one to throw in here is like, dude, there's no delivery mechanism to make one thing that big. There's no monoculture. Like there's no MTV where we all, I mean, you were too young, but like everybody else saw the Welcome to the Jungle video at, at the same, like, it's like, boom. And so every kid in America sees that we didn't have to look for, assuming you had MTV, like you didn't have to look for it. You didn't have to like be like on the, like everyone, there wasn't a lot of choice. Like that's what you saw. And, you know, one thing about the bands in our book and i'm not you know i can't say that bands today aren't like that but i suspect that they aren't because in a weird way the stakes are lower like like the whether it's poison or guns and roses or a lot of these other bands there's a level of commitment to making it and like to the craft and like that's almost that's basically like borderline psychotic, you know, like the drive, the drive yeah. that you see in the people in these bands in our book, like Nikki six, um, you know, and his, his sort of like total vision of Motley Crue and the fact that he's like, basically like a street urchin and the same thing with Axl Rose sleeping in the stairwell at tower records. Um, and the guys in poison, like living, you know, in a fucking warehouse where they're flying cockroaches, like, these bands and even if they don't end up all being best friends turn into out of like necessity like into these gangs and project this like aura of danger and it's like single-mindedness and like that we're just gonna fucking destroy the world that like i don't know if you you could even summon that as a young person playing rock and roll anymore because the odds of you actually taking over the world as a rock band and selling 10 million records are so low. But like back then, that was actually like a kind of, I mean, most people failed, but it was a bizarrely attainable goal. Like if you fucking get the right band together with the right dudes and the right attitude and the right songs, you just might take over the world. So, you know, I, I don't know if that opportunity is there and because the opportunity is there, I don't know if the total dedication, passion, and obsession with success could possibly be there. Because, like, I don't know if that exists for rock bands now. Hmm. And I don't think you know. also the work ethic. Yes. I too, just to, I'm going to join you on your lawn and, and say get off. Okay. Because <laughs> I just don't think the work ethic, you know, how long in these bands had a, you know, like you said, flying cockroaches and, and just taking it all in one van. Now it just seems like everybody, they, they sign up for TikTok if they don't get a certain amount of followers right away. Like it's on to the next thing. Like they, there was a certain dedication and work ethic that I, I really loved. And that's why it was always kind of interesting and funny that they would all dress so, you know, pretty that like these were hardworking people. That, like it's, mm -hmm. it was nothing was ever really given to them even the one the, the bands that didn't make it that you would see in the decline of western civilization you know like you're still putting in work you're trying really hard <laughs> you, i don't know you just it doesn't seem like you again not to make a broad uh, statement we all think i uh, understand that but what are the bands now that are putting in the hard work and sounding different and changing and I, I don't know i'm not getting that that's why you guys are writing about you know the 80s i'm doing a gnr podcast it's just like there's something missing today uh that I, I'm just not seeing or it's, it's not filling 
whatever musical need that I, <laughs> I, I, I want to get to make it sound even weirder. But I, yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, and to not even, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to make any sort of comment on how hard someone might be working today because, you know, who am I to say? But one of the things that we wanted to show in this book and, you know, for anyone that has, maybe does nothing but listen to Tom and I on these podcasts, you know, if, if there are people that spend their days just doing that. They'll probably hear me say this and be like, you know, shut up about this again. But we really... From the beginning, one of our main goals was like, we want to show that this was really like these guys, like Tom said, like worked their asses off and they had perseverance and like drive and commitment and creativity, like to do this thing that really does not get um, acknowledged as much as it should. And it doesn't get respected. Like people think of this music, you know, cause you see your videos, like, you know, your poison videos or like your Bon Jovi videos. And they're all like glitzy and glammy and like, you know, the records sound great, at least they did at the time. And like, you think of this music as very sort of major label created and like, you know, studio created and all this stuff and like big money behind it. And like, maybe at one point it was that, but in the early days, like these guys were living, you know, hand to mouth or worse, you know, Poison is living in this, like Tom said, this cockroach infested, you know, hovel and like, people are getting, you know, murdered and shot outside. And like, it's like super dangerous, you know, and like poison don't give off that vibe, but like Tom and I both as, as guys who have played in band bands and tried to do like the band thing, like we are like, I don't know if we could hang, like, you know, we'd probably be, I'll speak for myself because I don't want to speak for Tom, but like, I'd be Matt Smith, you know, like I turn around and head back to Pennsylvania because like, it's, it's fucking scary. And like, you're really, it's a crazy way to live and it's full commitment and you have to be willing to do that, you know? And like people, my thing is I've always felt like this music, as far as like the DIY aspect, like it's no different than like the punk thing in the seventies. It's no different than the indie rock thing in the eighties. Like these guys, you know, put it all out there and had no, knowledge that anything was going to stick in the public consciousness and like nobody wanted them at the beginning no one wanted this music um so we wanted to show like how much was behind how many years and how much struggle went into it before they got to this you know big mtv you know multi-platinum point and like and there's a lot of years and a lot of struggle I think that's why I like Lady Gaga or I like Lady Gaga so much. She mm -hmm. she seems to embody that, like how long it took her to, to break big and to be different. And I don't know that. So there are current artists. Yeah. But there again, it didn't seem as much, you know, watching these, you know, the poisons, the warrants, all of them just uh, they all seemed poor until they weren't, you know, anymore. I think that probably like, like again, like I'm not going to and and also but you know, and willing to put out, like to me, my weird takeaway up from the Guns N' Roses chapters in our book is that Guns N' Roses is really about four dudes being, it's people assembling around Axl Rose who can deal with Axl Rose. Really, when you boils down to it, like he's an incredibly intense, and I'm speaking for myself because Rich may feel differently, but like from the, the, He's so intense that like, if you can't, and like, so like Duff is like a punk from Seattle. He'd like, he takes no shits last. Like suddenly you get this group of people who can totally hang with him and whatever mood he's in it and who recognizes at his total talent and how good the band is. But like, these are also people choosing and you see this in other bands in our book, you know, people are not choosing the easy way out. They're not like, oh, you know, like, let me find the easiest people to get right. along with to be in a band. They're like, this band is awesome. I may hate the singer. I may hate this that, or that, but like, this is gonna, this is gonna go. And this is the real deal. Um, and I think that that's part of the hard work is just like willing to to be committed to be in a position not only that's physically uncomfortable if you're living in a shitty warehouse, but also in a band that's like a pressure cooker from day one. But you know it's good, and that's not like that is work, you know. Too. Yeah. That's why. Who who said the? Uh, it was Adam Levine. He said there are no bands anymore. Maybe that's that's why because people don't want to. 
uh, it could be, I don't want to, uh, again, I'm, I'm the younger one. I should be right. you know, just defending the, uh, you know, the work ethic of uh, the younger generation, but you, it's all about that one person being at the forefront now and not realizing it's the whole band. You know, I, it's Cinderella is a band. Yeah. Tom Kiefer is the front guy. Guns of Roses. I think Axel, when this is a, a topic of conversation throughout, it's a band. It's like Axel can do his own thing and, and be something else, but would he be Guns of Roses? No, he wouldn't be. I mean, I get that's a whole other uh, conversation. But um, no, I, I understand what you're, you're saying completely. And I know you got to run, uh, Tom. I don't want to keep you uh, too much longer. No, I'm, I mean, I'm good for like five. For, for like, if you, I, I don't, you don't need to like pull the plug. Like, a, <laughs> no, like no, no. <laughs> I just, as I'm like, just watching the clock, because I'm like, it's, we can keep going. And that's what's so great that you can write about, you know, this period of time in just recently. And it's still not enough. We can still keep talking about it and still keep writing about it. So where there's things left on the cutting room floor that you can see, you know, and a reprint, uh, like extra interviews that would come out, anything um, in the future to expect from this duo? Well, I mean, there, there's, there's a ton that was left on the cutting room floor, actually, which is shocking given that it's a, an almost 600 page book. But right. yeah, I mean, they're, they're, I feel like this is only a fraction of what we got. You know, it, it tells the story, hopefully, in a really coherent way. Um, as far as whether that stuff will come out, I mean, I don't know if there's, I guess maybe in the right, if there was a, a, the right avenue for it. But, um, you know, there is, there's going to be a paperback version of the book coming out um, a year to the original release date. So in March, there'll be a paperback version, uh, which maybe will include some more stuff like maybe not, you know, it, it might just be the same book with, with maybe a little bit added to it. Um, We'd but, like to at least mention like, as people, it's sad, like, but people are dropping off sort of as we, yeah, as the, you know, so we'd at least like to mention other people who have passed, mm, you know, yeah. um, if we so, can. Who are in the book. Um, yeah. But then not related to the book, there's where we're looking at doing, you know, we do have an, a deal to do a, a docu-series. Oh, great. Um, you know, with a production company attached to it and and a director attached to it. Um, so that would probably be the next thing that we'd be looking at doing together. Um, and then we're batting around ideas for for the next book. Oh, that's awesome. Now I'm, I'm excited. Well, th well, thank you. Thank yeah. you both. Uh, Tom Bajor, I'm saying it very yes. poorly. And Rich... Beanstalk. I'm never going to forget that <laughs> ever again. I, I took for granted. You, you should. I should have realized. You know, with my last name, W E I, would be different than B I E. I E. Uh, yeah. But then again, I'm mean, I'm a professional broadcaster, so these are uh, things to be expected, I guess. <laughs> uh, nothing but a good time. The uncensored history of '80s hard rock. If you haven't haven't read it yet, uh, I don't know why not. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful picture. It's like beautiful uh, photos in it. It's not just like great stories. It's just. It's it's it. Like, did it hit? It's on the bestseller list, isn't it? It's yeah, we made the New York Times bestseller I mean, list. So Just incredible. Which was awesome. You know, it's nice to, like, do something for four years and have people give a shit and like <laughs> it. I really, I will say that. Like, there's no, like, like, you know, that I cannot complain. We cannot complain about the reception that this book has gotten. Put it that way. Well, and continues well to get that. Thank you. And thank you so much for having us. Yeah, this has been great. I'm glad that we were finally able to, you know, get you back on Rich for a longer time. Tom, great to finally meet you. Uh, and, I will have more grays in my beard to match you next time. <laughs> and remember, when they say no interview, it's just 12 months and then you go back. <laughs> I will take that. I'll take that advice from you. I appreciate it. I mean, you might get yelled at, but I, that's what I would do. Right, right on. I'll do, <laughs> what would Tom do? I'll, I'll do that. Exactly. I love it. Right. Well, Tom Rich, this was great. Well, thanks everybody for hanging out. Another edition of Appetite for Distortion. Who will the next guest be? Who will the next guest? Uh, you know, where are they going to arrive? When is it going to arrive? The episode? Well, in the words of Axel Rose concerning Chinese democracy, you'll see it. I don't know if soon is the word.